Westwood College is a small secondary modern 10 miles outside central London. They were in special measures until 2004, with continual inspections and high staff turnover. But the whole school has succeeded in turning morale and results around. The English department has recognised different teaching and learning styles, and they share ideas regularly. Head of English, Peter McGregor, encourages collaboration and there's a mutually supportive atmosphere. Having now established some form of continuity with staffing, then our aim would be to be uh, to share good practice much more positively and much more in a much more structured way, so that we can all benefit from different techniques that have worked for one individual and can now be used throughout the faculty. And starting with poems from other cultures as the most problematic unit of work um, at GCSE. We look at kids today and say they don't care about other people. They're you know quite a selfish generation and all of those things. And so perhaps you know through this choice that all of all students here are having to study these poems and are having to find inroads into understanding people from other cultures. Like maybe we're doing them a much greater service beyond <coughs> just understanding a poem, just in terms of yeah. the wider world. But then you're doing them a terrible disservice if you take the moral high ground yeah. and say I want to teach the passion of poetry, the yeah. you know, yeah, the, I mean, the, you know. What, the romance that's in the language, and they fail their exam. My yeah. poetry teaching at the moment is completely schizophrenic because I'm I'm going through. The the, you know, I love this poem, then I sit and cry and read it to them, and then I give them tons and tons of notes, and we write meticulous notes on the anthology, but they know that they won't have those notes in the exam. But what's interesting as well, sometimes when we start doing this poetry, they think it's going to be poems from other countries, mm. and mm. They're, they're quite intrigued when it's poems from other parts of the UK. It's quite a close-knit community that, that surrounds the school. We don't have a great problem with racism, rather it's ignorance. There's just no real awareness that there are other cultures out there to value, and especially with the poems from other cultures and traditions. They don't have that initial hook that we need to grab their attention because they can be quite inward looking. Really the only culture they can be interested in sometimes is the one that they are living. They can fall into the trap where they might not value other cultures. So trying to teach them poetry about the value of other cultures is a big leap. I do like some poems, but some are just like a bit boring. But I prefer poems like rhyme and that. Rhyming ones are more funny and that, and the other ones are just... They don't really... They ain't, I don't know, I only like rhyming poems, really. I find some of them a bit that I don't really like, that are a bit boring, but I think I think they're gonna like keep on growing on me because I never used to like poems that much. But I think like since I started reading them a bit more, they like sort of grew on me a bit more. What I did this week was have a lesson with my year ten set one where we had a look at the six o'clock news and half cast. Would anybody like to hazard a guess at what sort of accent it is? So we started off by looking at the Tom Leonard piece. We did a, a couple of read-throughs which, which the students really enjoyed because they like to laugh at each other. So that was mildly amusing. This is thy six o'clock news. Thy man said in thy reason I took why BBC accent in cause yeah. If I took at a boat, thy truth like one of you. Scruffy, windy, sinky, it was true. This is a six o'clock news, the man said. And then we watched a video that had Tom Leonard reading over the top of it, so they got to um, hear his voice, and I think that made a lot more sense to some of them than the mumblings that we had managed to put together. When the first person read it out, um, they kind of didn't understand what the words were because they're so different to what we say. And it sounded really funny, like an English person trying to speak Scottish, it was just like hilarious. I couldn't even pronounce half of it. I mean, even when we had to like underline it and um, say what we thought it meant, I got it all wrong. <sighs> I yeah. just can't speak Scottish. <laughs> when I first read the poem, I was like, whoa, I don't understand any of this. And then we went through and broke it down and bit by bit I kind of put it together and kind of understood it. When we saw the video, that made it absolutely so much clearer and it was quite funny to watch as well. So it was more interesting. 
So basically what I did is just, I had the poem up on a flip chart and we unpacked it as a class. So we went through first of all, and we looked for words um, that we might not have recognized. And obviously, especially in the six o'clock news, it was full of them. And we had a fun time going through and working out what those words actually were in proper English. And then we, basically looked through to see if there might be any examples of the craft in there. On the structure, did, it, did the point come out that the way it's set out on the page perhaps resembles a teleprompter, so that the real six o'clock news people are reading... <laughs> no. ..from a prompter in front of them? Because that occurred to me as one why it's set out like that. Yeah, that's brilliant. No, it, uh, that had never occurred to me and it didn't come across with that either. Basically, all we looked at in terms of structure was the short lines um, sort of symbolised, you know, him spitting it out, so, he, you know, the anger and, like, really trying to make his point. And I think I tried to um, make that point to, book, to one of the students by saying, if you listened, and I really, like, spat things out and turned it into short lines, and they were sitting there going, OK, I get it, I get it. This is where it gets really interesting because the tone changes here. The second poem that we looked at was Half Cast and we did the same sort of um, thing where we unpacked it as a group and then the students were given a task where they needed to respond to the poem. And did they respond enthusiastically to John Agard doing his poem as a performance? Yeah. Because that's been my experience, they've always enjoyed his performance incredibly. Was that true in your class? Yeah, they did. And as we went around, as soon as we finished watching that, we sort of scanned around and I said, OK, what do we think? Feedback to me. And they were all like, he's crazy. <laughs> did you see his eyes? And so we kept taking that back to the passion behind the poem. Well, obviously, we have different approaches because Kelly's sort of breezed in from Australia and within the first couple of weeks, she was dropping things into the conversation like, sometimes we forget to look at our micro teaching <laughs> skills. <laughs> so she's given us all a kick up the backside, really, and made us think about how we approach things. But I think we do have a fairly coherent and cohesive approach to teaching it. Some of us choose. <laughs> not to do it all the time. We have this image from videos that are out there that a good classroom is one where everybody's yeah, sitting still definitely. and nobody's talking and everybody's looking at the teacher. And sometimes like you look around, um, when I was doing this lesson the other day, they were doing an activity where it was group work and it was, it was chaos. There was so much noise and they were, and they were passionate and they were all engaged. But if somebody walked in, I probably would have yeah, been horrified. Yeah, and we have to teach ourselves that that's mm -hmm. okay. If, the, if they're learning and, you know, it's increasing their understandings, then it doesn't matter if it doesn't look like the Stepford pupils. I think you have to be realistic as well, don't you? Because I think with my year 10s, I've been really, really strict with them because it's such a big class and they're doing the, the GCSE in a year. Um, and this is the first time this week that I've actually got them into groups and given them a task to do. And it has been noisy, chaotic, yeah. people fighting over pens and print sticks and stuff. And when I collected in the work today, it's absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. While we uh, saw the value in all the different learning styles, tests and things that were there, we started decided as a whole staff, specifically in the English department, to go down the route of VAC attack, as we called it, which is based on visual, auditory and kinesthetic learning. And while that in itself is certainly not innovative, I think taking the idea on as a department what, and what we have done with it has been incredibly successful and we changed our whole approach to what we were doing. If you just write loads of stuff out, it's boring. But if you do like activities and that, it makes it more interesting. Well, just talking and talking and make, then make you do work from a book, that's just too boring and no one takes anything in. I find it easier to like read things out and to write things and like get my ideas across if my friends are doing it with me because I like to talk and that's how I like to express myself. Group was fun but like it's difficult when you don't really get on with the people because they were like random groups and I prefer my mates. I think you can work a bit better when you can like discuss with other people like what you want or like, what you're going to do and like how you're going to write things and stuff like that but like sometimes I think it's better if you just like work in silence and just think like, by yourself what you're going to write. We can't be all things to all people. All we can ask is that as a department and a school, we are aware that these kids and we have different learning styles, different teaching styles, and as we go along, we have to make sure the main objective of the lesson is delivered in as many ways as possible. It doesn't have to be sensory overload. You know, it doesn't have to be chaos. Mm. I was trying to like reflect on the lesson and work out what might have worked well, and you know, Even and then I thought. 
well, who's the best person to ask? I don't really know what's effective. Like, like I'll go and ask them. And then I thought, how often do we really do that? How often do we say, well, you know, this is what we need to cover. What sort of things would you like to do to that, you know, will help you understand? They were saying, yeah, how can we um, read something from another culture if we don't have an understanding of, you know, what that culture sounds like or what it looks like? And, and, that's, and they were telling me that that was valuable. Mm. And I was like, oh, good. We are aware that they learn in different ways, but they're aware that they learn in different ways. So there's thanks that. To there's you, that thanks to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's that ownership now that they're aware that they don't just have to be told something; they have to learn it, mm. um, which is a big leap for them. And it's really. a whole cultural shift within the school as well that I've really noticed in the last couple of years of actually trying to get the kids to realise that learning does not just happen to you. <laughs> you know, I did a whole assembly on it. You don't. Someone doesn't slap you and you're educated. You know, you have to actually have it's some kind of. Yeah. yeah, you actually have to take some ownership and some. You know. Um, you have to take some responsibility for your learning. And I think because we've started having all these year 11 classes after school, children are actually choosing to mm. educate themselves and to use, I said to some kids today, and they just laughed at me, I said, you know, I'm a facilitator, I'm not responsible for your coursework, I'm helping you do it, you write it. <laughs> None of us are afraid to take rich risks, and there's a total blame-free culture. We can't come up here and go, I've just tried something, <laughs> and it just went horribly <laughs> wrong. And nobody's going to say, well, you know, you're not actually supposed to try those things. You're supposed to just make sure they're ready for their exams. Everyone has their own different learning style and then we just are able to understand it better. Yeah, I think it's good when there's, like, interaction between teachers and the pupils because, like, you get more out of it then you feel like you're part of the lesson rather than just being talked to. So if I was a teacher, I'd probably say to her that she should put us in a seating plan with our friends sometimes and not sometimes so that we can do more group work and work together as a little individuals in a whole class because not everyone gets to say what they want to say. We're not grammar school wannabes, I mean we are what we are and we know the nature of the kids and we deal with it, we don't spend all our time weeping and wailing about the state of the nation and wishing we had different types of kids, we actually deal with, with what we have and you have to value what they can bring as well, which I think is, is one of the things that's quite strong. We've really, really focused on doing whatever it takes to get C's out of as many children as possible. And I think we haven't lost that, though we're out of special measures and the exam results were actually really excellent. I think it was because it was like, well, this child, they're not quite there yet. And we didn't sit back and say, well, they're a D. We, we just, well, how else can we help this child with the poetry? And I think we really did that last year. And I think, I think it's paid off. I think we don't give up on the kids. Well, one of the ironies of working in the secondary modern school is that the, the children who supposedly failed the 11 plus then end up having reached the end of their schooling here, going to a local sixth form college, which may well be situated in the very grammar school that they didn't achieve at the, at the age of 11. As a faculty, we want to give them the choice of what to do. And if they need a minimum five A to C's in order to decide whether they're going to college or what college they're going to, rather than someone deciding their future for them, then I think that's where we get our satisfaction from. Yeah.